Well, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, um, and welcome to uh, what I hope sincerely will be the last of these uh, events in, in March um, as we move away from spring budgets. Um, very welcome. I'm Paul Johnson. I'm director of the IFS, and this uh, event will follow its traditional pattern. I will speak for a little while, giving you what I think are some of the headlines, and then some of my colleagues will um, give you some uh, more uh, colourful presentations of the details. Um, and you'll get a presentation uh, on the public finances, on social care spending, on the self-employment changes, on what's happening to earnings, and probably, uh, importantly, what we've probably all forgotten, which is what's going to happen in April, which wasn't mentioned um, in the budget. And um, I'll, I'll introduce my colleagues um, in a minute. So, um, as you all gathered, the last spring budget uh, seems to be going out with something of a whimper. I think it was one of the smallest budgets I can remember in just about every dimension. Number of policies, scale of policies, size of fiscal impact, size of the Red Book. Um, not that that's a complaint, particularly given that we've got another budget in November, and I presume that we'll get some more interesting things then. I also like the fact that Mr Hammond uh, promised quite a lot of consultations rather than diving into changes. We're going to get a consultation on business rates. We're going to get a consultation uh, on more uh, about the self-employed. Perhaps less keen on the consultation on social care. Not, it's not that we don't need a long-term strategy. It's that I can remember so many of these commissions, consultations and strategies. Um, as Elvis said, a little less conversation, a little more action, please. And, <laughs> in a different context, I realise. Um, or at least I was told this morning. Uh, um, as, as to the content of the budget, there are only um, two tax changes of any substance, and uh, I mean, maybe that's where the problems are coming for the Chancellor, because he certainly wasn't um, hiding the tax changes. It's an increase in self-employed national insurance contributions and a reduction in the tax-free allowance uh, for um, dividend payments. The former, the increase in national insurance contributions for the self-employed, we're going to stick our necks out and say we think that's a relatively welcome, though modest, change uh, designed both to share up, shore up the tax base uh, and create a slightly less unequal playing field between the self-employed and employees. The latter change, the change to dividend taxation, reflected concern that if you increase self-employment taxation, then you increase the incentive on the self-employed to incorporate interestingly undoes most of a change which was only introduced less than a year ago, that reduction in the dividend uh, tax allowance. The only substantive spending change was uh, money, more money for social care. I won't say any more about that, but my colleague Polly Simpson will say rather more. On the public finances, the OBR made by far its biggest ever revision, actually, in the forecast between autumn and spring for the year in which we're in. So in, num in November, it thought we'd be borrowing 68 billion this year. It now thinks we'll be borrowing just 52 uh, billion. That's quite a big uh, reduction. Yet that's barely changed for future years. We remain on course to be borrowing about 20 billion pounds um, in 2020. And remember, that's 30 billion pounds more than we thought we'd be borrowing in 2020 a year ago. So the deterioration in the public finances that we saw between March and November of £30 billion uh, is basically the same now as it was then. That leaves a lot of work to do in the next Parliament to get to the planned budget balance. I'm afraid it looks like being a third Parliament of austerity if the Chancellor keeps to his plans to get to budget balance in uh, by 2025. So what about the public finances? Well, I won't dwell on this year's changes. Um, there's a lot of one-off increase, one-off changes there to spending and to taxes. Tom Pope will tell you more detail about why we have had such a big adjustment. As I said, into the medium term, the projections are unchanged, partly because Mr Hammond didn't do anything, partly because the OBR didn't change its mind about very much. So we remain on course uh, to keep borrowing within 2% of national income. And indeed, we've got um, 26 billion of headroom there. To the extent that there is a war chest, that's the war chest. It's um, that Mr Hammond has said he's willing to borrow more if we need to borrow more. It's not a war chest at all. It's just a, a willingness to adjust if we have to. Um, and that makes some sense, given that all the forecasters will tell you that there's more uncertainty than ever about where, uh, where the economy is actually going to go. Uh, as I said, though, uh, 
uh, wherever we are in 2020, there's going to be a lot more work to do over the next Parliament uh, to get to budget balance if the Chancellor keeps to that. And that's likely to require more spending cuts or perhaps yet more post-election tax rises. I want to dwell on one thing the OBR said, which I think is in a way quite remarkable. It's a cumulative growth over the forecast is slightly weaker than in November as we now believe the economy was running slightly above potential at the end of last year. Now, it's worth dwelling on that a moment. The economy was running above potential. That's an economy in which GDP per capita has increased by 2% in nine years. 2% in nine years. Now, that's something that normally increases by 2% a year. And yet the OBR thinks that we're running above potential. That's another way of saying that all of that income growth, uh, national income growth that we might normally have expected over the last nine years is gone forever. It judges that that's just lost. Um, and with that, uh, we've lost the earnings growth and the income growth that you would normally expect. So this remains the big story, remains the big story of the last decade, a decade without growth, um, a decade without precedent, actually, in the UK in modern times. And I'll say a little bit more about what that means for earnings and so on in a minute. So let me move on to talk a little about the, um, the issue of the moment, the taxation of self-employment and incorporation. Uh, before I get on to the self-employed taxation point, that's it was quite one, one of the things that flattered the public finances this year was much bigger than expected revenue from a change to the taxation of dividends, which was implemented in April 2016. Now, it didn't flatter the public finances this year uh, because of revenue coming in from dividends paid this year. It flattered the public finances because a lot of people took their dividends last year before uh, the, in the tax rise uh, came in. So they were doing forestalling in the same way that people did when the 50p rate uh, came in. And that's had a big effect on the public finances this year. And quite remarkably, I think one of the most um, striking things in the budget documentation was that a lot of that has been driven just by a very small number of individuals. So it seems that 100 people, just 100 people, um, paid a lot of their tax this year, saving £800 million in tax eventually. That's £8 million on average by taking their um, dividends early. Uh, it's particularly interesting because it tells you a lot about the extent to which people do respond to tax incentives when it's worth their while to do so. And it also tells us a lot about the fact that the very wealthy uh, pay an awful lot of tax on which we rely, but they're also the ones who are most able uh, to change uh, what and when they pay. So to cite the increase in dividend taxation that that uh, change implied, the OBR has warned that the increase in the number of incorporate incorporations, the number of people who are behaving as small companies, uh, is on course to lose us three and a half billion of tax revenues by 2021. The OBR also reckons we'll lose an additional one billion of tax revenue as, an as a result of further increases in the number um, of self-employed. So the numbers of self-employed and uh, incorporated have been rising of 40% uh, of the increase in the workforce over the last several years has been as a result of increases in the number of self-employed and incorporated. And this matters for the tax base because owner managers and the self-employed pay a lot less tax than employees for the same amount earned. So the 2% increase in national insurance for the self-employed closes a small fraction of the gap between employees and the self-employed. In combination with the abolition of Class 2 national insurance, which comes in at the same time, it will leave any self-employed person with profits of less than about £15,500 better off, and um, uh, those uh, earning more than that worse off, with a maximum loss of about £589 a year for those with profits over £45,000. That said, the tax advantage to being self-employed will still remain very large because the really big difference between employees and the self-employed is the fact that employers pay 13.5% national insurance on anything they pay to their employees and nothing on anything they pay to self-employed contractors. So a tax system which charges thousands of pounds more in tax for employees doing the same job as someone else is certainly in need of reform. It distorts decisions, it creates complexity, it's unfair. Uh, and the incentives for companies to claim that people who work for them are self-employed rather than employees are huge. And that's one of the main reasons why you will have seen all these cases going through the courts. The tax system is creating that legal complexity. You'll note that the Chancellor at the same time announced that the £5,000 tax-free dividend allowance, which was introduced less than a year ago, will be cut to £2,000. 
To change that so quickly doesn't look like uh, coherent long-term policy making. Why has he done it? Well, he's done it because he's worried that by, when he increases the tax on the self-employed, he increases their incentive to incorporate. And indeed, uh, he would do. Um, so we, uh, so that's, sorry. Uh, and, uh, so he's right to worry about that. Rates of incorporation have shown themselves to be really very sensitive to the way the tax system uh, works, and they have been rising. So these feel like baby steps in the right direction, but they're sticking plasters, and they're not a fundamental look at the tax base as well as the tax rates. This is one of the most complex parts of the whole tax system, and it deserves, actually, not sticking plasters like this. It deserves a serious public review of how we want to make the tax system work. A lot more work, a lot more analysis, a lot more consultation is needed. Perhaps this is something else that it would have been best left until November. Um, Part of the problem, of course, is that the increase in Class 4 NICs looks like a breaking of the manifesto commitment not to raise NICs. Uh, uh, par polit political parties are rather prone to this. The last Labour government broke its manifesto pledge not to raise the basic or top rates of income tax when it raised the top rate to 50%. The problem here, as we said at the time, is that these are silly pledges to commit yourself to not raising the three main taxes, income tax, NI and VAT, for an entire par parliament ties your hands to an extent which is frankly absurd. Let's hope that the parties have learnt their lesson and won't resort to these sorts of promises next time round. One brief word on business rates. Um, the Chancellor announced some transitional protections yesterday. They'll be welcome. They're needed in large part not because the, uh, the, there's anything fundamentally broken about um, the system, but because the revaluation which happened has led to big changes uh, in rates because there are being big changes in valuations, there being a seven-year gap between valuations. And Mr Hammond suggested yesterday the revaluation will be more frequent going forward. That means the uh, changes that people will see will be smaller, and that's welcome. Um, in brief, what's happening now, as it's just worth being clear, is that what, essentially what's happening is that business rates in London, on average, are rising and rising quite a lot, and business rates elsewhere, on average, aren't. Um, and a lot of that extra revenue raised in London is going to be redistributed um, elsewhere. This is one of the things that happens when uh, property values, particularly in London, and the economy in London is doing so well relative to elsewhere. So let me say something about incomes and earnings. What really matters is what's happening to, their in pe to people's what happens to their incomes. And income and earnings growth over the next few years still look like being weak, I'm afraid. On current forecasts, Average earnings in 2022 will be no higher than they were in 2007. That's 15 years, 15 years without an increase in average earnings. Um, I, what, what superlative to use to describe that, I don't know. It's, it's clearly um, unprecedented. But within that, there are some rather interesting things happening. Employment remains very, very strong, um, and it's projected to remain strong. And among those in work, earnings have actually been doing better for the low paid than for the rest. The rising national living wage will ensure that continues. And overall, the highest earners have been doing the worst. And my colleague Jonathan Cribb will uh, tell you a bit more about that. Um, the top 1% pulled away from the rest during the 2000s, and they've been reeled back in over the last five or six years. So the ratio between earnings in the 99th percentile and the middle hit 5 to 1 in the late 2000s. It's now back to about 4.6 to 1, roughly where it was in 1999. So that's good news for if you want to reduce inequality. Uh, it's bad news if you want to get tax revenue because uh, high earners pay a lot of tax. Uh, and it's one of the reasons that we still have a big deficit is that the kind of growth that we have had, to the extent that we've had it, has been very tax unfriendly. Um, uh, uh, growth in employment doesn't give you much tax. Growth in incomes at the top gives you a lot. Another interesting quote from the OBR says the top end will be distributed the top end of the earnings distribution will be disproportionately hit, it says, by the UK exiting the EU due to the effects on higher paying sectors, including financial services. Changes in the distribution, therefore, are therefore expected to deliver a small drag on the effective tax rate over the next five years. That's another way of saying they're worried that one of the effects of Brexit will be to reduce tax revenues uh, because, for example, French bankers might go back to France. Um, let me finish by saying something about changes coming in in April. There wasn't much 
let's be frank, in yesterday's uh, budget. But there's an awful lot happening, and there's an awful lot happening from April. And the biggest of the changes happening from April are cuts to benefits, cuts to employment and support allowance, that's the new incapacity benefit system, uh, and cuts to tax credits. And these will have a much bigger effect on people's incomes than anything announced yesterday. Tax credit changes in April won't affect current claimants immediately, but they will mean big losses in the longer term. Uh, the removal of benefit from third and subsequent children will mean the long run 600,000 three, three child families will lose an average of two and a half thousand pounds a year relative to what they would have got and 300,000 families with four or more children will lose an average of 7,000 pounds a year relative to what they would otherwise have got. This and the reduction in the family element of tax credits will save five billion a year in the long run, dwarfing everything that happened yesterday all added together. And here's a thing that's also um, happening in the benefit system, uh, which is that if you're really concerned about changes affecting low-income self-employed, it's to universal credit changes that you should be looking, not to the national insurance changes. New rules mean that anyone declaring a self-employed will, after a year, be deemed to be earning at least 35, 35 hours at the national minimum or national living wage. Uh, that makes some con sense in the context of the difficulty of measuring the incomes of the self-employed. That will save one and a half billion, not a couple of hundred million, which is what the national insurance change uh, will do. So let me conclude just by saying that uh, clearly the most controversial announcement yesterday was the increase in the self-employment rate, employed NI rates, partly because it was almost the only announcement. Um, this appears to break, um, does break, a foolish manifesto commitment not to raise any of the major taxes. On the other hand, it's a small change taking a small step to correcting a big problem in the current tax system. What I'd really like to see is a, a, a more strategic approach to that. The problem needs a more thorough review and a st strategy to deal with it. If politicians continue to make silly manifesto pledges about not changing taxes, and the rest of us resist sensible changes when they happen, we'll end up with the tax system we deserve, once inefficient, inequitable, and increasingly unable to raise revenue in the face of a changing economy, i.e. a tax system like we've got.